why is it that these UFOs always land in Farmer Bob's Field in Puckerbrush, Kansas? Why don't they land in Dodger Stadium? Everybody has this ability. It is not a gift that, that I have that's special. One key aspect to analyzing feng shui is the environment. From the boundaries of the universe to the depth of your soul, embark on a journey through the unknown and unexplained as we explore mysteries, magic, and miracles. Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick McNee. Today, we'll take a look at a different way to talk with the animals, and we'll discover how to get the most out of our surroundings. But first, if you aren't a believer, would you believe there is a society just for you? Believe it or not. We live in a world of strange phenomena, where our faiths are tested by unseen happenings. While some believe without question, Others don't believe at all. As many as there are believers in UFOs, ghosts, and other strange phenomena, there are also the non-believers, the skeptics. Michael Sherman, publisher of The Skeptic magazine and a professor in history of science, wants more than stories. And he insists that the world needs all the skeptics it can get. Our bias, we have a bias, here it is, our bias is science. Uh, we're interested in what's your evidence for your claims and what's the explanation for your claim. Thousands of people claim to have seen UFOs and many more say they have been abducted by aliens. For some, it has changed their outlook on life and they view their experiences as clear as daylight. They don't need any more evidence, but the skeptics do. Why is it that these UFOs always land in Farmer Bob's Field in Puckerbrush, Kansas? Why don't they land in Dodger Stadium or the White House or somewhere where we can see them and it's a little more obvious? Michael obviously had definite opinions, so I wanted to know his thoughts on other life forms. Is there life elsewhere in the universe? I would say most likely yes, though we can't prove that. Have any of these life forms come to the planet Earth? I, our opinion is most likely not, for several reasons. One, the interstellar distances are enormous. It's very unlikely somebody will have come here. Much more likely is they will have tried to reach us through some sort of electronic communication, and we are monitoring that. So there is a legitimate search for intelligent life in the universe called the SETI program. But the people who claim that UFOs have come and that have been abducted by aliens and so forth, they, they have the, the, the flimsiest of proof and evidence. I mean, they have uh, the shadowy stories about how they were abducted in the middle of the night while they were sleeping. This is a type of hallucination that occurs during a dream called the hypnopompic hallucination where you wake up or you, in your dream, you wake up and you think you're awake and you can't move and at the foot of your bed is either a ghost or an alien. Angels have been with us since the beginning of time. They are normally associated with heaven. On earth, they are present when we need protection and guidance. The skeptics have their own explanation for them. The recent uh, popularity of angels has to do with the growing New Age movement, and basically people are uncomfortable with the quirkiness of the world. I mean, bad things happen, weird things happen that don't seem to make sense in our lives, and angels is a way of thinking, it's okay because I have this little Jiminy Cricket type creature hanging around me, looking after me, protecting me, and it's a type of a psychological feeling of well-beingness that people turn to, I think. Even the devil's work has been criticized. I think the devil is a little bit like angels in the sense that people are looking for something outside of the immediate world to explain 
the bad things that happen. And so if you can say, oh, the reason that good thing happened is because God wanted it to happen or my angels were protecting me. Same thing with the devil. Well, something bad happened. Oh, that's Satan at work there. Leading experts in the field of past life regression, who are also psychiatrists, explain that problems we experience in a present life are sometimes problems brought over from previous lives. For them, healing a patient sometimes involves hypnosis and regression into a past life. Past lives reincarnation, well, first of all, one of the serious problems with it is if people born today are actually people that used to live before, I mean, their bodies are inhabited by people who used to live before, then what happened to the spirit or soul of the person that's born now? Where, where does that go if, if it's being inhabited by somebody from before? It's a serious problem with the logic of, of reincarnation. People have always been fascinated with death and where we go to when our spirit leaves our physical body. Some people have claimed to have died and come to life. Their glimpse of what a wonderful world awaits us after death remains an extraordinary tale. Michael Sherman has his own theory about death. When we die, nobody knows what happens. Scientifically speaking, we have no final answer on that. Personally, I think that this is all there is. The physical body dies and whatever, whatever is in my mind, my whatever you want to call it, spirit, my soul, I just think it's my personality, it's just me, my memories, is gone forever. I mean, as a scientist, I can't prove that there is not life after death. However, I can't prove that there's not a Santa Claus either. But it's very unlikely that there's a Santa Claus. It's very unlikely that ghosts exist. Very unlikely that we will live beyond the physical body. One of the first principles of skepticism is that you must never fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. Life in itself will always be an enigma. Ghosts, angels, and UFOs only add to the mystery. Whichever way you look at it, for those who believe, no explanation is necessary. For those who don't believe, no explanation is possible. In the 1950s, a Colorado housewife, Ruth Simmons, was hypnotized and regressed to another life in Ireland in the early 1800s. She spoke with a thick Irish accent and called herself Bridie Murphy. Skeptics played a role in debunking this reincarnation story, but once the facts were proven, they became supporters. This story goes to show that even the most skeptical person can change his views. Research has proven people can communicate telepathically, but can animals? According to interspecies communicators, we can ask our pets anything if we listen to what they have to say with our minds. Animals can tell us what they're feeling. Animals can read our thoughts. Animals can even communicate with other animals. Lydia Hibby, an animal psychic, gives consultations to people looking for lost pets or those curious or concerned about their pet's health and well-being. And he said for a while he didn't realize he was a cat. He said someone bottle fed him. Do you know? Yes, we oh. did. We bottle okay. fed him. When he was a tiny shop. little guy. Yeah. Okay. Because he said, I didn't think I was a cat. I was just real curious about it and um, wanted to see what my dogs and cat had to say. She feels great and she's certainly very contented with you. And this. she's grateful that someone's taken such good care of her. Because I was told that she may have been abused and uh, I was so afraid. That I, I couldn't stand thinking about that, that she may have been, so I've, I've always tried to make it up to her. He said he really likes it when you talk to him all the time. He likes kind of being your therapist also, and I think that's the other reason why he doesn't want to share you with another cat. He said, I like being the only one. Um, I'm thrilled. Um, I'm really impressed, you know, at the information, and so much of it seems to <clears throat> just really fit. And, uh, and then there were some surprises, too, that I'm really glad to know about. The only abuse that she said that she dealt with was someone who um, was very angry all the time and they yelled a lot. So if someone raises their voice, which she said you haven't really had to do. 
I'm very happy to have gotten her. And to know that she's mentally stable is, <laughs> is good news. I am relieved. <laughs> I'm very relieved. Even Stacy Patterson, a falconer with South Bay Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, uses animal psychics with birds of prey. Now when I found, when I started working with the birds, the injured ones, is they would be so stressed out in captivity, they wouldn't know why we were there, what we were doing with them, why they were caged. And I felt this real helplessness about not being able to assure them. And I realized at that time that I had to do something extrasensory, something paranormal, but I didn't know what that meant. And he was living with me, but the problem I had was he screamed. And he screamed incessantly. And he would start screaming at the first thing in the morning and go all day. So I was considering letting him go. Her frustration with Rhett led her to take a workshop with Carol Gurney, an interspecies communicator. And that afternoon, we actually got quiet, sat down, meditated with Rhett, and everyone was just basically awestruck with their feelings about Rhett. He came across as an extremely powerful bird. And we all got messages about balance. The Rhett's message was about balancing our male and female energies, balancing our intuition with our action. Since then, Rhett's become calm and quiet. Veterinarian Kathleen Carson from Coast Pet Clinic doesn't doubt the value of psychic communication with animals. In fact, she highly recommends it. Because most people are just so agonized when the euthanasia decision comes up of, you know, they have to play God and they don't want to play God. How can they decide if their animal is to live or die? And if there's one more way that they can get input from the animal itself, as to whether the animal wants to live or die, to me, that is just, uh, it's just the most welcome thing in the world. Carol Gurney telepathically communicates with animals for all sorts of reasons, lost animals, behavioral problems, even the issue of death. But the good news about this is that everybody has this ability. It is not a gift that, that I have that's special. We all did it when we were children, we're born with the skills of telepathy, it's a universal language. Do it in the morning. It's the best time. They're relaxed, they've just woken up. Sit in a nice, comfortable chair, no music, no radio on. Take lots of deep breaths. Begin to relax the body. Breathe into the areas where there's tension so that you can release the tension. And then as you feel relaxed, sink into your heart center here. And then, just from your heart, just allow yourself to connect with your animal. Really, really slowly, and just feel your animal. And then from there, ask a question mentally. Are you willing to communicate with me? How do you feel physically? And what you do is you just imagine the question, send it out, direct it to that animal, and then simply wait for a response. And don't be surprised, it may come immediately in all different forms, words, feelings, impressions, and pictures. When more and more people are getting in touch with animals, what they're really doing is they're showing us how to connect back to our own spirituality. When we go out in nature and we touch the hearts of those animals, when we, when we touch the hearts of, of the hawks and allow ourselves to be with them, we are once again touching our spirituality of who we really are. There's no doubt that our surroundings can have an impact on how we feel. There's an ancient belief that a simple thing as the placement of your furniture can increase your energy. It's called feng shui, the Chinese art of placement. In ancient China, emperors and people with power controlled the feng shui masters. The feng shui art was considered so valuable and so important for the success of the emperor that all of the feng shui masters were kept in the forbidden cities or areas controlled by men of power. Both major branches of feng shui, traditional and transcendental, are based on the I Ching, or the Book of Changes. 
in the transcendental or black hat sect of Tibetan tantric Buddhism, cures for problems with qi call for objects like the bakwa, crystal ball, or mira to enhance the circulation of qi. David Twicken, a specialist in both traditional and transcendental feng shui, came to analyze our offices. When we evaluate feng shui, one of the most important areas in a building is the entryway, the front door entry to a building. We say that's the mouth of qi, that the universe will bring the qi into the business or the person's home life through the front door. So we want everything in the way, direct pathway of the front door to be open and allow the qi to flow smoothly. So if we look at this situation here, we see the front door to the building, but we see a building right opposite, within probably 50 feet. This is creating a blockage from the energy on the other side and around us to be able to come in and nourish this building properly. The way we, we would correct it, one way would we be is to put a crystal ball up here, and if we hang the crystal ball and we do what is called the mudra and the mantra, to call upon the universe to come and to bring energy and move energy through this building properly so it can be circulated and nourish people would be the proper correction. Or you could put a mirror which is curved inward to attract the universal energy to come in here properly and be nourished. One key aspect to analyzing feng shui is the environment. So we would look at the buildings and, it, and trees and everything around the building we live in or the office we live in. So if we look at this building here, this big building, and it's sort of much taller than our building, and it kind of like puts down a pressure on our building, and it blocks the chi flow from the whole environment from nourishing and nurturing our building properly. But how important is the solar system or the alignment of the planets? Okay. The solar system and the alignment of the planets is a very, very important uh, aspect of feng shui. It's uh, an area that very, very few teachers know about, very few people know about, even in China. And it's the deepest portion of feng shui. It's sort of like getting to the DNA, the genetic makeup of the energy or magnetic field in feng shui system. And the way we do that is we utilize a ancient um, geomancy compass called the low pan and once we determine the inner structure of a building we align this low pan up in a certain configuration to tell us the energy field configuration so the combination of the alignment of this uh, the planets in the solar system at the time the building was constructed with the low pan reading determines the magnetic field the deepest and probably the most important aspect of feng shui, traditional feng shui. After the exterior analysis, we went inside the offices to see how everyone was doing. Then once you make it through the outside of the building and the front of the, the front door, how important is the interior design? The interior design and the structure and the layout is vital in the health and the success of the workers in an office environment. Some general rules are, number one, never have your back to the front door or the, or the entryway. So we can see here, if somebody is sitting here, their back is to the front door. So every time somebody walks by or someone comes in, they have to turn around. So the whole central nervous system is out of whack. They don't know what's going on. They're constantly hearing things. So they'll be uh, very irritable, very uh, on the edge, not knowing what's going on. But most importantly, neither of these desks are in what we call structured to be in a power position in the room, in the office. Because most of what's going on, they're not aware of. But if they were to flip this desk around and the person was sitting something like this with the desk out here, then they see everything that's going on and they're in a position of power and they know what's going on. It's very, very important for their psyche, for their emotions, for the whole psychology, it changes all the way you are. Okay, one of the basic rules in feng shui is never to be in the direct line of an open door, especially at the end of a hallway, because the momentum builds 
So as we see, this gentleman in his desk is in the direct pathway, and we call it a dagger or a shah. We say it's a shah, a negative energy is gonna bombard this gentleman. And things like irritability, anxiousness, edginess, his whole central nervous system will be out of balance and out of whack. After Howard's evaluation, I was a little nervous about my office. We checked it out though, everything was okay. The universal life force is the energy within every person, animal, and thing throughout the universe. The existence of this energy has been a part of human culture since ancient times. It is known to the Hindus as prana, to the Polynesians as mana, and the Chinese call it chi. The Chinese concept includes the idea of yin and yang, light and dark, active and passive. Balancing the yin and yang is important for good health. It's fascinating how even small changes in one's environment can alter one's outlook. If you believe. Do you believe? I'm Patrick McNee. Join me next time for more mysteries, magic, and miracles.